Welcome to LHA Church. You're about to hear another inspirational message from Pastor Jerry Galloway, lead pastor here at Lighthouse Assembly. It's our prayer that this message is an encouragement and blessing to your life. If you have your Bibles with you today, uh, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 21. I would encourage you that if you have the YouVersion app, uh, to head to the events tab of the YouVersion app and you'll find all of the notes and the passages for this morning. Revelation chapter 21 is where we're going to head. I had, uh, all week long I had prepared to, to continue with the series that we were in on the power of love and uh, starting about Thursday or Friday the Lord just began to stir my heart and began to stir my spirit and um, so today I'm going to share a little different direction with you than I had planned. You know, my desire today, my heart is to stir up the hope that is in our hearts as believers. Um, I like to regularly remind you of what is waiting on us. I like to regularly remind you that this is not all there is to it, friends. The best is yet to come. Can you say amen to that? My prayer this morning is for those of you who are walking through valleys and you're going through a season of difficulty to, to today look past your current circumstances. Look past the current trials and look past the current val uh, the valleys that you are having to walk through and to see what is yet ahead of us. To keep pressing on, to keep fighting the good fight of faith. The trials will not last forever, but heaven will. Can you say amen? amen? Keep holding on. Don't give up. Don't give in. Keep fighting that good fight of faith. A passage that I love is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 12 and 13. He says, therefore, I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and you're standing firm in the truth that you have been taught. It is only right that I should keep on reminding you as long as I live. There is something that transpires inside of us when we begin to talk about heaven. There's something when we begin to read about it, we think about it, we're talking about it, we hear conversations about it. Even though you and I have never been there, there is a fondness that wells up with inside of us we began to think of what heaven is going to be like. You know, our understanding of heaven really is the hope of the church. Our understanding of that hope enables you and I, it gives us strength, and it enables you and I to press on with endurance and perseverance. Psalm 30 and verse 5 says, Weeping may endure for the night. Have you all had any times of weeping in your life? Weeping may endure for the night, but the rest of us says, but joy is coming in the morning. This is not all there is to it, friends, and I want to encourage you that if you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you know Him to be the Lord of your life, I want to remind you today that the best of your existence is yet ahead of you. Revelation chapter 21, I have, over the years I have shared from this passage several times, and there's probably no greater description of heaven, no uh, greater condensed description than we can look at it except Revelation chapter 21. And this morning I want us to begin walking through this 21st chapter to see what God has to say about this place we know as heaven. Revelation chapter 21 and verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. First thing we notice, the Bible tells us that he is making a new heaven and a new earth. And you'll find that word new in that verse really means new in quality, new in character, new It's in comparison to the old. A good word to render that would be the word renew. It is the opposite of everything that you and I have known in this life. Now, you and I are entering a new season. It's called spring. Can you say amen? 
<laughs> winter has uh, passed us. And, uh, you know, you can go out now and you see the, the leaves starting to bud on the trees. Paul and I pulled down the driveway and I said, hey, Paul, look over there. The forsythia bush at our house was uh, starting to turn bright yellow, reminding us that a new season of life is before us. You know, it won't be long and the trees will be in full bloom and the flowers will be bloomed out and the green grass will be there. And, you know, we'll look at it with a mind that is so beautiful. But, you know, the reality is the world that you and I live in, even at its best day, is still in a season and a process of decay. When sin entered the world, everything began to be in a state of death. The physical body, even the world around us became, un, uh, excuse me, it came under the curse of decay. Now, to contrast that, we see in verse number 5 there, Revelation 21, it says, He who is seated on the throne says, Look, I am making everything. Somebody say everything. everything. I'm making everything new. It says, first of all, there's going to be a new heaven. Now, the word heaven is used to describe uh, three, three thoughts there in that process. It describes as you go out and you'll see a beautiful blue sky and the fluffy white clouds and you know, those days where the blue is just, it's like it couldn't get any more blue than it is. It's so beautiful. That is one description of heaven. And then in the nighttime when you and I go out and we lift up our eyes and look into the sky and you see uh, more stars than you and I can begin to count. And you see the stars glistening in the darkness. That as well is a word that describes the heavens. And then there's a third uh, area, a third element we would call the third heaven. That is the place where... Uh, God is at, that's where uh, heaven is. And when we find the scripture says, I'm making all these things new, what we find is what he's talking about is all of these things are going to be in a process of being made brand new. Now, when John says there's going to be a new heaven, he talks about new heaven and a new earth. I want to tell you, friends, uh, everything you're putting your hard work to, uh, it won't be long, and it's, as spring is coming, the warmer weather is going to continue to stay with us, and some of y'all are going to get out, and you're going to start planting flowers, and you're going to be uh, doing work around the house and all those things, and, and you're going to have a beautiful home, and, and it's going to be wonderful for you, but I, I, I just have to tell you something. It's not going to last. Everything you know, you're putting your time, your energy, and effort to, uh, I'm not saying don't mow the yard this summer, but... Uh, yeah, it's, it's not going to last because the Bible says not only is he going to make a new heaven, but he's going to make a new earth. All these things that we have known, they're going by the wayside. They're not going to last. And this concept of new is really not, uh, it's not a comparison to our understanding of new because you and I come to it with a bit of a bias. We know that if we get something new, it won't be long and it has the ability to break. You, you buy you a new car and uh, it can be broke down on the side of the road. You you buy a new piece of garment, it doesn't last very long. You buy a new appliance for your house, and, and it's not very long until it's outdated. You buy you a new computer, and next week it's already old. And uh, things are constantly, you get you a new iPhone, and then the new one comes out next week. Um, it doesn't matter when you get it. When you get it, the next week the new one comes out. It's just the way it works. And we know everything in this world is aging. It's getting old. It's in a continual state of decay. I want to tell you something. When we begin to talk about heaven, heaven is not going to be anything like what you and I imagine uh, on this earth that we live in. Nothing in heaven will ever get old Nothing in heaven will ever be affected by the curse of sin. It is a uh, brand new concept, really, for you and I. It won't ever change. It's, it's like when we get to heaven, everything will be in this perpetual state of newness. Uh, there's never a day where it's a day old. It's always in this state of being new. Now, look at verse number 2. He says, when I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. Now, the new Jerusalem is going to be the new city that God is preparing for us. 
There's four things I want you to notice about that city right here in the text. The Bible tells us, first of all, that it is a holy city. It's a holy city. It's a city that's pure. It's a city that's righteous. There won't be any lying politicians in heaven. There won't be any media that lies. Um, <laughs> kind of current, there won't be any fake news in heaven. It'll all be new news. <laughs> We're going to a place, friends, that is not like anything you and I have ever experienced on this earth. There will be no more crime. Nobody's going to steal from the neighbor. Nobody's going to defraud their neighbor. Nobody's going to be cheating on the clock for work. Nobody's going to be doing anything that has anything to do with sin. It's going to be a holy city. Now, imagine for a moment with me, if you will, what a holy city would be like. All the things that you and I have experienced uh, difficulty with and negativity with in this earth. It'll all be gone. It's all going to be gone. It's a holy city. Nothing sinful, nothing ungodly. Imagine a place like heaven's going to be. Next, the Bible says, not only is it a holy city, but it says it's from God. The scripture says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. The book of James says that every good and perfect gift comes down from the Father above. Let me tell you, if you've got anything good in your life, if there's any area of your life that you can put your finger on and say, it's good, it's from God. It's not because you worked overtime and bought it. It's not because you earned something. It's not because somebody else did something for you. Every good, notice that the Bible says every good. Every good and perfect gift comes from where? The Father above. God is a good God, and he wants to bless his people with good things. Can you say amen? amen. Now, I say it's from God, but it's been prepared by God. John chapter 14, Jesus said, I am going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you will be also. God is preparing an incredible place for us, friend. It's better than anything you can imagine. Your eye has not seen and your mind has not comprehended the things that God has prepared for his people. But I'm here to tell you, the best is you yet ahead of you the best is yet to come then we find John tries to put into words what he's saying he said is prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband what John is saying is this place is going to be so beautiful so incredible it's going to be anything but ordinary now next thing that we see is that the Bible says that heaven is a place where God is near look in verse 3 he says, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's home is now among the people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. Look at verse 7, those who are victorious will inherit all this and I will be their God and they will be my children. The thought of God dwelling it's the picture of how God has dwelt with us throughout human history. In the Old Testament, God was said to have resided on the mountain called Sinai where his people were. Later, his presence was to have dwelt in the tabernacle. And yet even later, his presence filled uh, the area in the temple behind the great veil. Man couldn't go into God's presence. God's presence was too strong. He couldn't go into God's presence and live. And then in the book of Revelation, we find that God is seated on a throne in heaven. These images have always caused us to picture God at a distance. God at a distance from his people. Now, we know in the beginning of time, you, book, you look in the book of uh, Genesis Adam was created. They're there in the garden. It's, it's Adam and Eve is there, but also we find God is there with them. And what we find is that God is about once again to restore his relationship with mankind. Our dwelling will now be with God and he will live with us. Now I want to tell you something. If you think, you know, last Sunday we had an incredible time in the presence of the Lord here in church. But you haven't seen anything yet compared to what we're getting ready to have. 
You see, when we came in last week, I heard reports all week long from people on Facebook said, man, wasn't Sunday morning incredible? And I had people I'd pass by and they'd say, man, the Lord just, they said, that was just for me today. Well, I wanted to tell you something. That you may have experienced one side of him last week, his love and his grace and his mercy for you. But listen, when you get there, everything that makes God who he is will uh, encapsulate us and we will be inundated with everything that makes him who is his holiness, his peace, his love, his mercy, his grace. Any characteristic you can think about God will totally encapsulate you and you will be inundated with everything that makes God who he is. It won't be like, oh, I get to to go to church and maybe God will show up. Listen, we're going to a place where he's already at and we're going to be with him forever in his presence and we're never yet going to leave his presence again. For years there was a passage of scripture that I had a great deal of difficulty understanding. It was Psalm 116 and verse 15. It says this, precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Some of the passages says that the death of his faithful servants. I'll be honest with you, I struggled with that passage because I would stand at the caskets time after time after with loved ones, losing a loved one, and it felt anything but precious. I saw as loved ones had to say goodbye and saw them as they would get in their automobiles and they would leave a cemetery and leave that loved one there at the graveyard. And I said, Lord, I don't understand because there's nothing about this that seems precious. But yet the word of the Lord says precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. And I felt like a couple of years ago the Lord spoke to my heart and he said this, you know what? Death for God is nothing like it is for you and me. When we see death, we see it as an end. God sees it as a beginning. When you and I see death, we think it's all over. God says it's just beginning. Everything that caused man to be in sin and decay is all over. The curse is finally broken. And God's going to be with his people. And God's going to be with his children. And forever we're going to be in his presence. Listen, death, death is not the end. Death is just the beginning of everything that he has planned for us. Imagine with me for a moment. So we're constantly talking about wanting to be in his presence. Imagine for a moment, I think time will be no more, but the best way that you and I have to understand it is 24 7 living in the presence of God. God is right there. Imagine living in the presence and the love and the mercy of our mighty God. Notice what verse 7 says Those who are victorious will inherit all this. Now, on this earth, we understand an inheritance. Every one of us will inherit all these things. It's not like, okay, y'all are over here and y'all been good this week, so you're going to get more than somebody over here. The Bible says you're going to inherit all these things. Look at your neighbor and say, it's all mine. We're going to inherit all these things things. Heaven is going to be what it is because of the nearness of God. We'll be enveloped by everything that makes God who he is. Now, it's going to be great with his presence, but let me tell you, thirdly, heaven is going to be an incredible place because it's going to be absent of the curse of sin. Verse number four says, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Notice that God himself will wipe away every tear from their eyes. God will do it. Not an angel, not another saint, not another believer. God himself will wipe away the tears from our eyes. It has been said that tears are symbolic of the pain of life on this earth. The things which have broken our hearts, shattered our dreams, things that have disappointed and disillusioned us, things about, we, about which we silently anguish on the inside. The curse, what we found is the curse of sin. The curse has caused mankind much heartache in this life. Everything that has caused us tears will be gone. God, let me tell you something. God is always aware of tears in his people's lives. The Bible says in uh, Psalm 56 and 8 that God collects our tears in his bottle. 
Friend, there's not a time that you cry that God doesn't see it. There's not a time you cry that God doesn't care about it. You may say, well, nobody cares about my circumstance. Listen, friend, you can't ever live a day of your life and ever say God doesn't care about where I'm at today. He cares about everything that touches our life. But there's coming a time. When God is going to come up to you for the last time and he's going to wipe away every tear from your eye. It will bring an end to the things that have caused tears and sorrow. One of those areas, the scripture says, is no more death. No more death. Think about that for a minute. No more funerals. No more funeral homes. No more caskets. No more viewings. No more separation. No more parting. No more having to stand by the grave of a loved one and say goodbye. If there is no more death, then friend, there's no more things that cause death. No more sickness. No disease. No cancer. No more tests to be run. No more doctor's office. No more prescriptions. No more of all the things. No more uh, back pain. No more joint pain. No more days you get. Nobody get out of a chair in heaven and go, oh. No more. No more. No more aging. No more knowing that your time is getting shorter. No more funeral plans and preparations. No more pains. No more aches. No more aging of the body. I told you earlier, he's making all things new. Listen, friend, you're going to get a new body. One that's not wearing out. This one won't get tired. This one won't give up. This one won't give in. All things new, he said. <laughs> Nothing to wear out. It's all in new condition. Nothing in heaven ever gets old. On this earth, we only know things to wear out. But in heaven, nothing wears out. Not only does he say death, but he says there'll be no more mourning, sorrow, crying. This is deep things. Things that have caused us inwardly to mourn. Think about that for a moment, if you will. Think about the things in this life that have caused you sorrow. Nothing there will a, be able to cause you sorrow anymore. I've heard people say, I've only known sorrow my entire life. Then, friend, heaven is going to be incredible for you because you're not going to experience sorrow even one day in heaven. Nothing to be discouraged or disappointed about. Nothing to be burdened by. Listen, there will be no depression in heaven. Nothing to have to worry about. No anxiety. No frustration. Imagine. Imagine a day. Just imagine one day, if you will. No worries. Nothing to be upset about. Wow. It's kind of like being in heaven and the guy in front of you, the light turns green and you don't even care. <laughs> He's just sitting there and it doesn't matter. You get ready to leave the house in heaven. Everybody's running behind, and it doesn't matter. Nothing to be upset about. We have only known difficulty on this earth. Things that have caused us emotional discomfort, all those things will be over. No more worrying about finances, worrying about jobs, worrying about kids, marriages, or life. It goes on to say there'll be no more pain, no more pain physically, no more pain relationally, no more pain spiritually, no pain from broken relationships, no pain from hurts and offenses, no more being left alone and dejected, no physical joints to wear out, no more hearts to clog up, no more muscles to get sore, no more headaches, back aches, leg aches, no more aches at all the pharmaceutical company will be out of business all the doctors and nurses nothing left to do all will be gone all the things that have caused physical spiritual or relational pain will all be behind us imagine heaven for a moment just imagine it compared to the, the, the journey you're walking right now. 
You know, often when someone dies, I, I want to tell you something. I don't like, I, I don't like death. Uh, there's something about death we just don't like. We don't like that separation here. But friend, we have viewed it in the wrong way. Amen. We've often viewed death as the end. Death is not the end. You are an eternal being. You will continue on whether here or there. When this physical body is expired, you are still going to continue to exist. Eternity is sure. I don't know when eternity is coming. You know, everything in life we know has an expiration date. I don't know when mine is going to be. I don't know what day, what year, what month. I don't know if it will be in the spring or in the winter. I don't know if I'll be here till the Lord Jesus returns and I get raptured or whether I'll go by the way of the grave. I don't know that. But I do know this. There's a 100% chance that I'm going to step into eternity. And there's a 100% chance that every person in this room, you're going to step into eternity. People say, well, I, 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 don't, I don't want to think about it. Friend, it won't stop it. I find a lot of people, they don't want to talk about death and dying. They don't want to talk about living. And I'm all for living. But listen, dying is a part of my life on this side. It's coming. It's coming. I'm going to pass that road one day. But I'm thankful to know that I have hope that goes beyond that. Man, no wonder the world is in despair. The world sees it as death. They see it as over. They don't see anything beyond it. Listen, when I close, man, the Lord help me. When I close my eyes on this side, the Bible says I'd rather be absent from this body and be present with the Lord. I don't know exactly who's going to meet me at the gate, but I know when I get to the gate, I'm going to open my eyes, and I'm not going to see 5268 South 800 East in Upland, Indiana. But I may, my address may be 101 Gloryland Way. I don't know what it's going to be, but I know when I open up my eyes, it's not going to be in this state of I don't know where I'm at. I'm going to know exactly where I'm at, and I know the one. I've never seen Jesus. Jesus with my eyes, but I'm pretty convinced when I see him and I lay eyes on him the first time, I'm going to know who he is. Listen, friend, that's the hope that you and I have. That's the hope that you and I have. Just a, just a little less than two years ago, we laid my father to rest. There's not a day in my life that I don't think about my dad. There's many times I have dreams about him. In fact, I told Paul just the other day, I had about a week ago, I had such a real dream um, of my dad. My dad's been in heaven with Jesus just short of two years. But you know what? There's coming a time I'm going to see my dad again. Amen. And this time, this time, I'm never going to say goodbye again. Amen. This time... It's not going to end. This time, this life, I watched my father walk through Alzheimer's. And I watched Alzheimer's rob my dad from the man he had always been. Listen, Alzheimer's won't have any power on my dad in heaven. Because he got a brand new body, a brand new mind. He's brand new all over. And I want to tell you, when I get there, there won't be any of that for me either. Because it's going to be brand new. And friend, the hope for you today is, you can know that you're going to be brand new in heaven. And you know that the best is yet ahead of you. I want you to notice something, though, in the passage. It talks about all of these incredible things we're going to see. But notice what verse 8 says. Notice what verse 8 says. Verse 8 tells us that not everyone is going to be going to heaven. It says, but the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, and those who practice magic arts... The idolaters and all liars, they will be consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. For this is the second death. Now this is a truth that I'll be honest with you, we wrestle with. Because when I think about heaven, my heart rejoices. I told you earlier, there's a, uh, even though I've never been there, there's a fondness that fills my heart when I talk about heaven. 
But when I think about the fact that not everybody is going to be going, no wonder there's sadness on this side. No wonder there's things that concern us on this side. You know, we can understand. I, I think most of us, we are an atonement conscious society. And we can say, you know what? I can understand maybe why the murderers and the sexually immoral and those who practice the magic arts. And we, we, can, we can rationalize that and we say, okay, I can understand that. But listen, the Bible also says the unbelieving. Some of y'all have incredible neighbors. They're great people. Some of you have family members. They're great people. They'd do anything in the world for you, but they are unbelieving. Everyone isn't going to heaven. Just because you sit on a church pew does not promise you heaven. Just because you may work for the church and you may give in the offering plate and maybe you've done good things and you've been a good person and you've helped uh, your neighbors and you've helped other people and you've done all these good things, friend, does not mean you're going to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. There's only one way to heaven. The Bible says broad is the way that leads to destruction. Narrow is the way that leads to eternal life, and only a few find it. There will be those who, friends, will not experience the things you and I have testified about, and really our hearts have testified and bore witness with this morning. There's some that are not going to experience those things. Scripture is very clear. 1 John chapter 5 and verse 12 it says, Whoever has the Son, talking about Jesus, whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. John 3 and 18, Whoever believes in Him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. John 14 and 6, Jesus said, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Please hear me for the next few moments. Friend, there's only one way to heaven, and that's through salvation in Jesus Christ. I believe you may be a good person. I believe, man, I believe you'd do anything to help anyone. I have some personal friends. They're just great people. I like to be around them. I have one particular friend that I just, I like, I like doing things with. But he doesn't know Jesus Christ. And every day I pray for him. Because I don't want to experience just good things here. I want to experience the great things that are yet to come. There's only one way. Going to church, friend, is not the way. Going to church is the good thing and the right thing in your life. You need to be around body of believers. But just coming and sitting in the church, friend, will not make you ready for heaven. You can even give in the offering plate. It won't make you ready for heaven. You can uh, try to do good things for the church, and we appreciate good things that you try to do. But listen, don't do them to try to think it will get you heaven because it will not. Nothing will gain you heaven except salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the door to heaven, and you must walk through that door. There's no back door. There's no plan A, plan B. Salvation is found in no one else but Jesus Christ. He said, I am the way. I am the truth, and I am the life. It's found in Jesus Christ. Friend, 
Whatever you do, don't miss heaven. Whatever you don't get accomplished in this life, make sure you accomplish being ready for heaven. The truth is, I want to live, this year I'm going to turn 50 years old. I want to live way more than 50. I kind of like this living thing. I want to live a long time. I'm okay if I live to be 100. Is that much longer I stay around to aggravate my wife? <laughs> I'm okay as long as I live. But you know what? As much as I enjoy living life, the truth is, friend, this may be, I'm just telling you the honest truth, this could be my last Sunday here. There's no guarantees. No guarantees of my life. I can't promise you I'll be here. And friend, you can't promise me that you'll be here next week either. And so I want to ask you, all these things we've talked about heaven and all these things we want to experience about heaven, are you ready for heaven? Are you ready for heaven? You say, well, you know what? When I was a kid, I, I came to church and I'm asking you today, today, are you ready for heaven? Are you ready for heaven? You say, well, I was baptized as a kid. My question to you today, are you ready today for heaven? You say, I've done a lot of good things in my life, Pastor. I'm asking you today, are you ready for heaven? You may say, you know what, Pastor? I've been in this church for years. You may say, I've spent all of my life being in church. But my question today is, are you ready for heaven today? Today. Today. Would you please bow your heads? My Father and my God, today I call upon you. God, and I call upon you right now, Father, for this moment that we are in in this room. I pray right now. In the name of Jesus, Father, that you would speak to every heart and every life and every person that's in this room. Lord, you know us by name and there's nothing about us that you aren't aware of. Father, I pray today for those that have walked into this room and Lord, deep in their heart there is a concern and um, there's a, an agitation on the inside because they're not quite sure. They're, they're worried. They're concerned about heaven. Lord, they're concerned that what tomorrow could bring for their life. and They're concerned that if today were their last day that they might not be ready. They've been good people and they've done good things, but all those things laid aside, they're just not sure they're ready for heaven. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, would you just speak to the hearts of all men and women in this room? Lord, if broad is the way that leads to destruction, there's so many that are on that path. Father, I pray, Lord, there not be a person in this room today that dies without Jesus Christ. Hmm. Lord, I pray every person in this room to be saved and ready for heaven and to know beyond a shadow of a doubt. I pray every person in this room would know beyond a shadow of a doubt that they're ready for heaven. But Father, I pray today, if there are any that aren't sure, Lord, I want to give them an opportunity today to be sure. Father, I pray that you'll speak to each heart. Speak to each life now, I ask. Speak to each heart. In Jesus' name I pray. Would you please keep your heads bowed and believers to be praying right now for this moment that we have together. Friend, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior and your Lord, I want to talk to you for a moment this morning. If you don't know beyond the shadow of doubt that you're ready for heaven, friend, you don't have to live your life that way. 
You don't have to live your life wondering, am I ready for heaven or not? You can have the hope that I was talking about earlier. You can have the confidence to know that if I were to die, I'm confident and I know where I'm going to spend eternity. I'd like to have the opportunity this morning to pray for you right where you're at. I'm never going to embarrass you. How many this morning you might say, Pastor, I'm not 100% sure I'm ready. You say, I'm concerned. You'd even say, Pastor, I'm a little worried on the inside. Friend, I'd like to have the opportunity to pray for you. How many of you this morning? Well, heads back, you just lift up your hand and say, please remember me in prayer. I want to be ready. Yes, 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 yes. My friend, you can put your hand out if you've raised it. Yes. How many others this morning? Yes. How many others this morning? You join these that have already lifted their hand. I'm just not sure, Pastor, and I want to be sure today. And you just lift your hand with these others and just say, please remember me in prayer. Yes. still about it. I'm going to pray a prayer. I'm going to pray a prayer for this entire room. But friend, I'll be honest with you, I can't pray the prayer for you personally. So as I pray this prayer, here's what I'd like to encourage you to do. Just say, Jesus, I know you're the only way that I can get to heaven. Lord, I ask you right now while I'm in this room that you would prepare me for heaven. Friend, whatever has kept you from being sure you're ready for heaven, friend, he's able to forgive that in a moment's notice. Whatever it might be, friend, he can do it in a split second, right, right where you're seated. You don't have to do anything except just talk to him. So while I pray this prayer, friend, if you lift your hand, would you just say, Lord Jesus, make me ready for heaven. Lord, forgive me and make me ready. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I know, Father, you're in this room. And I know, Lord, it's your incredible love that's drawing all of us to be in right relationship with you. Father, I pray for my dear friends that have lifted a hand this morning. Lord, remind them how much you love them and how much you care for them. And, oh, God, all the incredible things you have in store for their lives. I pray, Lord, this morning, right now, right now while I pray, Lord, I believe they're talking to you. <laughs> Lord, I believe you're listening. You can hear them as they're talking to you. Lord, I pray that forgiveness would come where forgiveness needs to be. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, you'll bring them into right relationship with you. Lord, I pray that you will do in a moment what a great amount of works can never do. I pray, Father, you'll fill them with confidence to know that you're the one that makes them ready for heaven. And, and in doing so, Lord, I pray you'll fill them with confidence that they can leave this place today knowing that they're ready for heaven. Hmm. God, I know you can do it because you did it in my life. And I know you'll do it for them today. So, Lord, each one of these friends, and I, God, I pray for, I pray for the ones who didn't lift their hand, but they're still calling on you right now. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus, for mercy and grace. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in their hearts. 
Thank you for what you're doing in their lives. Father, I trust you to take really good care of these people that lifted their hand this morning. I trust you, Lord, to do what's needed for them. And I place it all, Lord, in your hands. And Lord, I give you thanks for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me tell you something, friend. You don't have to do anything else to earn heaven. Jesus has already done the work for you. The Bible says if we call upon him, the Bible says if we believe in our heart, God has raised Jesus Christ from the dead, we can be saved. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins to him, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He's able, whatever it would be that would keep you and I out of heaven, he is able, he is stronger to take care of all those things, friends, when we lay those things at his feet. Would you stand with me this morning in closing? I'd like to do one more thing before we leave. I told you a few minutes ago that I have a good friend of mine who doesn't know Jesus Christ. And, uh, I pray for him often and I talk to my wife. I tell her that I want to see him saved. Probably one of the happiest days <laughs> being his friend will be the day that I know when he receives Jesus Christ as his Savior. I know you have friends and loved ones too that are unsaved. And how many of you just by lifting your hand, you say, I have loved ones or friends that don't know Jesus. Would you just keep your hand raised? And I want us to pray right now. Would you just right where you're at, would you just begin to call their name out before the Lord? Father, I pray right now, Father, for the men and women right now that have a hand raised. and They're praying for friends and loved ones. I pray for my friend today. God, you know right the room where he's at. Lord, I know you've already been dealing with his heart, and I pray, God, you'll continue to deal with his heart. God, I pray for the day when he comes to know you as his Savior and Lord. Father, we pray today for sons and daughters. We pray for husbands and wives, mothers and fathers, brothers and sisters. God, we pray today, God, our families would be saved. We pray for our families to be saved. We pray for our neighbors to be saved. We pray for our co-workers to be saved. Lord, I pray that you'll send. God, if it's our kids, send a new neighbor in. Send a new neighbor that will share the gospel with them. God, if it's a loved one, send somebody in the workplace. God, that can share the gospel with them. Lord, often our words fall on deaf ears. But I pray, God, you'll speak to their heart because, God, they can't get away from you. God, when they lay down at night, you're there. When they're in the car, you're there. Wherever they go, God, you're there. Lord, I pray that you'll speak to their hearts, soften their hearts. God, whatever it takes, we don't want our loved ones to be lost. So, Lord, we lift up today. We lift them all up. God, we pray they'd be saved. And, Lord... As we pray that prayer, I pray, use us. Use us. Use us. Because, Lord, as we're praying, send somebody to minister to my family. Lord, we may be the one that you want to use for somebody else's family. So, Lord, help us always to speak up for the gospel. Help us always to share the hope we have in Jesus Christ. Help us to not be backwards about answering about the faith that we have in Jesus Christ. Lord, would you use us? Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that all of Grant County would be saved. I pray it'll be hard to live in Grant County and not go to heaven. I pray, God, that there'll be salvation. It'll go up down every one of our streets. I pray, God, it'll fill our schools. I pray it'll fill our government buildings. I pray it'll fill our workplaces. I pray, God, there'll be a mighty rush of men and women being saved and coming to the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I pray that lives will be turned around and transformed by the power of Jesus Christ. Lord, I believe you can do anything. I believe nothing's too hard for you. That's why I ask God, let everybody in our county be saved because I believe you can do it. So, Lord, we put it all in your hands today. And, Lord, we just want to say thank you for the hope that we have in you. Thank you, Lord, for the promise that the best is yet to come in our lives. 
Thank you, Lord, that the days are ahead of us are greater than the days that are behind us. Thank you, Father, for that hope. Now, Lord, I ask for each person in this room today, I pray you keep them safe. I pray you keep your hand upon them. I pray joy will fill their hearts and peace to be evident in their lives. I pray, God, you will withhold no good thing from them. In fact, I pray, Lord, that you will work all things together for the good in their lives, I ask. Father, I trust you for it, and I believe you for it. In the name of Jesus, we ask it. Everybody said, amen. Amen. God bless you all. We love you today. We pray the joy of the Lord for your strength. God bless. Have a great day.